Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the May 9th, 2023 meeting of the Lextrand Employees Pension Plan and Trust uh, Committee meeting. My name is Jill Barnett. I'm the general manager for Lextrand, and I'd like to call this meeting to order. The time is 10.01. The first item on the agenda is an approval of the minutes from the November 8th, 2022 meeting. Has everyone on the committee had a chance to review those minutes? So I would ask for a motion to approve those minutes. Motion by Nikki Falkenberry. Is there a second? I'll second. Thank you. Paul Schoninger. All in favor? Do you aye. say aye? aye? Any opposition or discussion or corrections? All right. Hearing none, uh, we can move on to the fund performance report, which will be delivered to us by Mariner Wealth Advisors. We have uh, Pam Thompson and Michael Gosney. Thank you. All right, thank you all. Um, you should have the book in front of you. And we like to just start out with just a brief update of our firm. Um, we're just, we're continuing to grow. We're coming you, to you today from Louisville. Um, we're anticipating an office in Lexington, I'd say over the next few years, um, but we're very happy to be growing and expanding. Michael and I are both um, coming from the Louisville office. Um, so not a whole lot has changed other than that. Um, page three just gives um, a footprint of our company nationwide. Um, we are you know, backed by a very strong company, but it's a nice blend of having those resources, particularly in our investment strategies, but putting that together with our local presence here in Kentucky. So we like to have that, that balance, um, which we think is very good and helpful for our clients. Um, page four just shows you who the advisors are as part of our team here. Uh, Michael and I are both part of that um, with five other individuals as well. I'm um, so very happy to be here. And then um, the next several pages are a summary and the full document of your investment policy statement. Um, so we like to kind of cover on page five just what those highlights are. Um, but the most important aspect of the investment policy statement is your asset allocation. Um, that is simply the guideline telling us how much of your total portfolio you would like to have in equity investments versus fixed income investments. Um, so the equity investments provide the growth long term, which is so important for this pension plan so that it, it can live on and continue to pay the payments to people as they retire. That's critically important, so it needs the growth that comes from the stock part of the portfolio. Um, we have a target of 60%, but a range of 50 to 80% that you have asked us to stay within. So that will drive that growth long term. Um, but as we all know, the stock market comes with volatility, um, and so it's also important to have a bit of a cushion. So that cash and bond portion is for providing a cushion so that in times of volatility, we can still make the payments that are needed without having to sell stocks while they're down. So it's really important to have that balance. Um, so the range for the bonds is 20 to 50%, the range for cash is just zero to 10%. Um, everything else about the policy is just to ensure that everything is very prudently managed, well diversified, focus on high quality investments. Um, and so that is how we are proceeding on a day-to-day -day basis. So the rest of this section of the book is just the full document um, of all of the specific guidelines for the investment policy statement. There have not been changes to this um, in, a, in nine years, um, so I'll, we'll keep moving unless there are any questions or interest in discussing any of that. Anyone? Okay, I'll turn over to Michael for the next portion. Um, so this is a chart of the 2022 stock market performance for the various uh, We, we want to go to page 17, so if you go to that next section of the book, go to page 17. Um, this shows the major indices uh, in 2022 and kind of what happened in the stock market. Of course, we started out 2022 with high inflation, getting higher, um, war in Ukraine, um, the Fed raising interest rates, there was a lot of all that brought a lot of volatility to the markets in 2022, as you can see. Um, at the low point was in September, the S&P 500 was down about 28%. Of course, your portfolio was not. It was just the global, one of the largest indexes. Um, and then fourth quarter uh, transitioned up as inflation started to kind of cool. Um, so like I said, 2022 was, was relatively volatile. Um, we feel like we could go into a recession at some point this year. Maybe we're in one now, um, but 
just looking at the numbers um, kind of suggests to us that maybe the worst has already happened in the stock market. When we look at the stock market and the economy, they're two separate things. Um, so the S&P ended down about 18 percent. Um, international indexes about 14 and 19 percent. Small cap down about 20. And when we turn to the next page, looking at this year, a lot of those lagging indexes that happened last year are outperforming so far this year. Um, of course, the Fed is increasing interest rates still. We're still looking to see if that's going to continue or halt or decline. Um, but so far off to a pretty good year so far. Um, going to the next page, we kind of look at your portfolio summary. Um, the top left just shows a breakdown of those asset classes. As Pam mentioned, we're about 75% in equities and alternatives and 25% in cash and fixed income. And that just shows a breakdown of, of each category. In the top right, um, we look year-to-date performance. The total portfolio is 6.8%. Um, broken down fixed income, 2.4. Equities and alternatives, 8.8. Um, as I mentioned before, 2022 was a rough year. Um, your total portfolio was down about 12.4%. But I will also note that 2021, we had a really, really nice year at 16.9%. Um, um, the farthest column is the prior 10 years, um, looking annually, um, the total portfolio is up 6.8% every year for the last 10 years, which is really good. Um, I believe the actuarial, uh, Steve, if you could, uh, it was 6%? 6%. 6%. 6%. So, so, so we're above that. Um, so it's been very good performance. And then below just shows a breakdown of the one account. It's you know, the same percentages that we just discussed. Um, the next page kind of goes into a little more detail on the activity summary. Um, you see the year-to-date column where we started, um, the net cash flow, so contributions minus distributions um, gives us that number, the accrual of uh, uh, dividends and interest, bond accrual, um, and then the market increase so far this year. If you look at last year, obviously it was a bad year in the markets. Um, the market value decrease was about 2.8 million. The year before that was an increase in 2.5 million. So it's almost like we're just going a, a step back in time. It's not a, a loss. But as you can see so far this year, this year, we've already made up about a third, a little over a third of what was down last year. Um, so just pointing that out. Um, of course, when we talk about stocks uh, or, or equity allocation, we have the active strategy, which are the individual stocks that we manage, and then we have passive investments. So this slide focuses on the active stocks, um, which is 67% of the total portfolio, total equity portfolio. Um, we've got our three categories, growth and income is the far left. Um, those are your steady eddies, um, dividend payers, uh, and or dividend growers. Um, beta is relatively low in the majority of these companies, which a beta of one uh, matches the S&P 500, so anything below that is less volatile. Um, we have our cyclical growth stocks. These are more opportunistic. They will ebb and flow with the economic cycle. Um, so we may be in and out of these positions a little bit quicker than others. Um, and then of course, high growth. These companies are growing at a faster rate based on the business that they are, the industry that they're in. Um, growth has been a really nice performer so far this year. Um, so you might see a few more names than the last book that we had. Um, so that active strategy will shift from well, other categories into other categories as part of the active, um, the active strategy. Um, are there any questions so far on any of that? Okay. Um, the next page, page 22, I like to call this our risk control slide. It really looks for stock concentration risk. Um, the largest, largest holding is Apple at 5.4%. No, not a big deal. Um, but you can also see the total cost versus the market value. And there are a few positions that have been held for quite a long time that have some really nice gains in them. Um, another thing I also like to point out on this slide, um, if you look at the sector column, um, it shows technology, energy, consumer de defensive, industrials, financials. So there's quite a few different sectors um, that are in this 
um, top 10 holdings, so it's not just tech weighted, it's not just healthcare weighted. Um, there's lots of different sectors, um, which is actually noted on the next page, which shows a breakdown, a pie chart of all of the sectors that were invested in. So we're very diversified, um, not just in the total portfolio, but also in the top 10 holdings, which is very important. Diversification is, is key when it comes to investing. The next page goes into the passive investments. So we talked about the active um, individual equities. Now we're talking about the passive uh, funds that we own, which are uh, four ETFs, exchange traded funds. These are very low cost funds invested in lots of different securities. We've got the growth and the value index on our large cap. Um, Russell 2000 is our small and mid cap and uh, the EAFE uh, index for international. And you can just see the difference between growth and value just in the large cap year to date, last year, and then the 10 years ending for each of the funds. Uh, they pretty closely track uh, the following or their uh, indexes um, as well. So we like to blend those two strategies together to give a really nice mix. And it provides further diversification as well. Um, the next page. Um, well, the last page of this tab is our bond review. Um, this basically just shows, you know, when we look at bonds, we look at them as holding them to maturity. There's, we don't look to sell bonds. Um, we buy, when we buy a bond, we know what we're going to get paid in interest, and we know what is, what it's going to mature at. So the trading volume, or the trading price might go up and down based on interest rates. Um, as interest rates rise, bond prices fall. But as long as we hold the bond to maturity, it doesn't matter. We'll continue to collect the interest, and then once the um, uh, maturity date comes, we'll get the par value back. Um, so this bit is a breakdown of what is coming due. Uh, this year, 1.125 million is going to mature. Now that interest rates are higher, it's a really good opportunity to reinvest back into higher yielding um, corporate bonds. Um, and that's the name of the game is for us to buy individual bonds um, that are laddered out in maturity. And so if you look, you can see all of the maturity dates kind of through, you know, the next handful of years. Um, and that way, when some come due, we can kind of extend the ladder or fill in spots that are, uh, that make the most sense. Um, and that changes um, every day. So when those come due, we'll look for other opportunities to reinvest that, uh, that capital. Are there any questions? Okay, and then we'll go into the last section behind tab two. Um, we like to just give kind of an overview of what we're seeing in the economy, our outlook um, for both the economy and the market. Um, so looking at page 27, first, when we talk about the economy, we're talking about gross domestic products, so GDP, which is the output of our country. Um, here we're showing a chart over the past 20 years, just the growth of GDP, so the growth of the, the overall economic output. Um, that dotted blue line is the trend growth, meaning kind of the average over that time has been about 2% per year is kind of the typical growth for our country's economy. Um, the, the gray line is just what it has actually been, so sometimes it's above that, sometimes it's below that, um, but it has continued to grow. It's been fairly robust growth. Um, on the right is just a breakdown of what is GDP made up of by category. You'll see the largest portion there in blue is consumption, so about 68%, and that's always the case. About two-thirds of what we count as GDP really is consumer-based um, in a lot of different ways. So there's just a lot of focus on that when we're looking at what are the prospects for a recession um, and what do we think the outlook will be. Um, so we do pay very close attention to the labor market. So if you turn to the next page on page 28, there's a number of statistics we can look at to say, you know, how is the job market? You know, low unemployment. We definitely have a very low unemployment rate at 3.4%. But what this chart is showing is actually the number of people who are unemployed versus the number of job openings that are out there waiting to be filled. The unemployed number of people is the blue line. The dotted red line is the number of jobs out there looking for people. And it's a very unusual relationship for the number of job openings to be greater than the number of people looking for those jobs. 
you'll see most of the time it's the other way around, where there's usually more people looking for jobs than jobs available. Um, that, we would say, from an economic standpoint, sounds good. It's, you know, it's, it's healthy for people to be able to be employed and find a job pretty easily, as this would imply. The, when we talk about the, the issue with inflation, however, this can create a problem in that very tight labor market leads to employers needing to pay more to get workers, to keep workers. As those labor costs go up, those companies tend to raise their prices too to cover those costs. Those rising prices then is what we get with inflation. So we have prices getting higher because they have to pay more to keep people. Um, so what the market is looking at very closely is wanting to see this get a little looser. So you know we don't like to see that it's hard to get jobs, but the market would like to see that the labor market maybe is not so tight um, so that it can ease some of the pressure on inflation. Um, the next page on page 29 gets into a little bit more detail, but there's been questions about you know, how much are people participating in the labor force. So that's what this is looking at, what they call the participation rate. Um, the, that dark blue line, you can see how it dropped significantly. That was with the pandemic and the shutdown and people being out of work for a while. Um, but that has come back, not quite to where it was, but it's being compared to that red dotted line as what had been projected by the Bureau of Labor Statistics. Um, and it was kind of a natural decline as we have aging baby boomers and all of that. So it has actually recovered to above what had been predicted. So we would say, we would kind of look at this as kind of full participation, you know, at least based on where we are from a demographic standpoint. Um, but if we turn to the next page, we get into seeing what the actual inflation has been. Um, on page 30, we are looking at CPI and what has that change been when we compare it year over year, and that's the number that usually gets quoted. It reached a high last summer of about 9%, so you can see that blue line. Um, we're looking here at a 50-year period of time to just put that in perspective, and you'll see we've not had inflation numbers that high um, since the 1980s, so it's been about 40 years, um, and that is, that is you know, that is a problematic situation and what the Fed has been fighting by raise, raising the interest rates. Um, if you look at the next page, it just drills down a little bit more to say, well, what's in that number? You know, what is it that has gone up so much? This does it first by just basic high-level category. Um, and you can see that the largest piece of this increase recently has been what they're calling core services. And we'll get into that detail in a minute. Um, that has remained high. Um, the other area that has stayed kind of high is the food inflation. So we've seen you know, that kind of go up and not come down a whole lot. Again, here looking at it on a year-over-year -year basis. So it's saying in this latest number, whether this is February or March, it's comparing it to February or March a year ago. So what happens when you're comparing to a whole year ago, if it does start going down monthly, it doesn't show up until you get a whole year down the road. Um, and so as we go to one more page on this, it'll show, this is a busy chart, but um, on a month-to-month -month basis, we actually have seen things level out, as Michael alluded to earlier. This, this chart is looking at monthly numbers um, going back for 24 months. Um, the top set that are in the box are the year-to-year, -year, so you see what a Y slash Y. But that second box is the month-to-month -month number, so it's the M slash M. Um, this is being done as a heat map, which means if it's green, it's considered low, it's not a problem in terms of inflation numbers. As it turns yellow, orange, and red, the darker the red, that's a higher and higher number and of, of concern. Um, and so we can kind of see where, you know, where has it turned red or where is it green. Um, but if we look at that month-to-month -month number, you know, we see both, both year-over-year -year and month-to-month -month hit its high in June of 22. So that's where... That top number reached 8.9% on a year-over-year -year basis. Month-to-month, -month, it reached a 1.2%. But if you look at those monthly numbers after that, ever since last June, it's actually been a very low number. Um, so we, we've seen that kind of level out. It's just we have to get to this next June before the year-over-year -year numbers will now then you know, probably be a pretty low number. But the other thing that's interesting here is when you go further down, it shows the different components, so energy, food, core goods, and services. And it's just a really kind of quick, easy way to see where has the inflation been and where is it now. 
it has not been in the same place and just stayed there. So I think it's interesting. It actually started back with core goods. This was back in early 2021 coming out of the pandemic. So this is when we had factories shut down. We had ships lined up at the ports. There was a shortage of supply of goods, but people still had money in their pockets, plenty of demand. So that strong demand with lessened supply created this spike in prices for basic items, these core goods. You'll see that was the only place we had significant inflation. That has basically worked its way through the system is no longer an area of high inflation. The second area in early 2022 is when Russia invaded Ukraine. That is a significant, that part of the world is a significant source of oil and grain led to a spike in inflation for energy and anything food related. And so you'll see that's where the red is where you know, we saw that kind of early in 2022. That has also pretty well worked its way through the system is no longer high inflation numbers. The only place that we still have this higher area of inflation is in the core services, most of which is shelter. So it's really the price of rent or the, the what they call owner's equivalent rent. So kind of the cost of owning a home um, those are the, the pieces that are high now that weren't high before. So it's really, it's kind of shifted from one area to another to another. So it's not just kind of one big, bad, ugly number that has gotten high and stayed high, but it's something that's kind of working its way through the system. We would expect, we're not going to have a perfect crystal ball, but we would say it's, it looks like it's very close to kind of being through the system. And we'll see probably those numbers coming down here, especially when we get to we're a year past the June um, where it got so high last year. So just, we think it's helpful to kind of see that detail and, and see how that all played out over the two years. The next page just looks at um, interest rates. So this is the Fed funds rate on page 33. Um, taking it back again all the way to the 1970s to put things in perspective. Um, the Fed just raised rates again, so we are now at a 5% Fed funds rate. Um, that is at the long-term average. So there's been a lot of comparisons to the 70s and 80s, people saying, oh, we're, we haven't gone up this much since those times, um, but this is really nothing like that. You know, you can see here on the chart how high the rates were back then. Um, we're really just back to what the long-term average has been. Um, we don't, it, yes, it's, it's an adjustment from where we were since rates were close to zero, um, but we would say this is not a problematic level. It's one that can be dealt with and sustained and people can adjust to it and continue, you know, doing just fine. Um, page 34 takes a look at the Fed Fund's futures. Um, so this is a market for what people, what, what these investors think is going to happen in the future to the Fed Fund's rate. And what you'll see is that the market is expecting that rates will actually be on the decline by next year. Um, so whether that plays out, we have to wait and see. Um, but the Fed has said with this last increase that they just did that they think they're probably done raising rates. And so the question now is how long do they stay where they are? And if we do end up in a recession, as Michael said, we very well could be. Um, you know, it's the, the caveat is the worse it is, the faster interest rates come back down. And so that would then, you know, be part of that recovery process. And we would expect things to play out pretty well. Um, page 35 takes a look at the relationship between co consumer confidence and the stock market. Um, so this looks at the consumer sentiment index um, that's done by the University of Michigan. This is also looking back for about 50 years. And what, what they've done here at the, the bottom points, you'll see the little blue dots and the dates. Um, looking back over the past 50 years at some of the worst points for consumer sentiment. So consumers are feeling very negative. They said what happened in the 12 months after that for stocks and put that number in. And what you'll see is that for the 12 months after some of the very lowest points in consumer sentiment are actually very strong returns for the market. So it's actually a pretty good contrarian indicator that when people are really feeling bad about things, as awful as it sounds, that, that tends to be when looking forward that the market tends to do pretty well because it's like, okay, if we get you know, some of this bad sentiment kind of washed through, um, you know, things do tend to turn from there. Um, it's not something we use to predict the next 12 months, but we're just noting that we have hit also a pretty low in consumer sentiment as we were kind of middle of last year. 
Um, so we'll have to see how that ends up turning out, you know, for the market. Um, page 36 is one that we continue to update for you, um, but this is just the reminder of how frequently the market does pull back. So this is looking at year by year, going back to 1980. Um, the, the gray bar is showing what was the full movement in stocks up or down for that year. But the red number underneath is saying what was the largest decline that occurred sometime during the year before things played out and finished where that gray bar is. So if you focus on the red numbers, you'll see how often, not every year, but most of the time, we get some kind of pullback of 10% or more most of the time. Um, and a lot of those years it finishes positive, not every year. Last year was one that it was, it was a big drop and it did stay down for the year. Uh, but you see how unusual that is, and it's extremely unusual for that to happen two years in a row. Um, so, but I think it's just helpful to, to see that and, and to remember, you know, how often the market does pull back, and that's just kind of the process. As it does grow long term, we, we get these ups and downs in the shorter term. And then finally, the last page on page 37, and we do like to put out a forecast at the beginning of the year. Um, at a very high level, just, you know, the expectation that we have is that the economy will have probably a, a more, um, much more moderate growth this year. It could even be negative, so we're acknowledging, yes, we could end, end up in a recession with some negative growth for the year, um, but if we do, we would expect it to be very mild. Um, the Federal, Federal Reserve continuing to raise rates, which they've done again. We think they might be finished at this point. But, you know, knowing that, acknowledging that, but also acknowledging where we started the year for the market, um, our investment team puts probabilities on different scenarios. And for this year, they're putting their highest probability on actually a very strong return for the S&P. They've said perhaps 19% for that part of the stock market overall. Um, it's not a guarantee. We, we certainly like that number, you know, better than what we saw last year. Um, so far this year, it's, you know, we're, we're kind of halfway there. Um, so it's, it's certainly quite possible. But there's a lot to get through, um, a lot of other concerns out there. So we want to make sure that we kind of keep an eye on all of that. So we'll stop there. That last section is just the detail of the holdings in the portfolio. Um, but we're happy to answer any questions that anybody has. Thank you, Michael and Pam. Does anyone have any questions? Well, we appreciate okay. the review of right. um, the fund itself and the economic, economic review and outlook. We will move on to the actuarial, actuarial report. Uh, we have Steve Osborne here with us, and I believe everyone has a copy of that report in front of them. Steve? Thank you. Here is an actuarial report. It's in these beige. Covered. And what I'd like to do, there are some beige pages in the front followed by several uh, pages on uh, white paper that are labeled as exhibits or appendices. So I'm really just going to go through this front, which should summarize uh, my conclusions and we can get into some of the details if needed. But the very first page has three columns and the far right hand column is the most recent results uh, of January 1st. 2023, there were uh, 349 people included in the plan, and I've got to count as to how many are. It's about the same number of active people as was a year ago. We have a few more retirees than we did, and we have 99 people who have quit Lextran but can draw a pension when they get old enough. All right. The market value was uh, 17.6 million at the end of the year. The uh, reflects an investment loss of about 12% for 2022, which I think Pam's already talked about. Um, minus 12 is still minus 12, but to give you some context, when I'm done here, I'm gonna go to a meeting with another group that lost 16 for the year. And uh, for them, that was a lot, a lot more money terms of dollars. Uh, contribution levels, the recommended rate is $2.10 and you're putting in $2.27 between Lextran and the employees. You'll notice that that recommended rate didn't really change a lot uh, since last year. 
and um, I will get into the reasons for that in a moment. But if you'll turn the page. I've shown the rate in terms of cents per hour because, I mean, that's how you pay for it. So it's easy to determine whether, yeah, I'm putting in too much or too little. And the recommended rate also assumes that we will make 6% a year. The changes since last year, the main change again was the investment return. Now, your fund started out 2022 with a surplus of assets over liability of about $3.7 million, All right? So you had more assets than you had liabilities. Well, now they're about the same, okay? So what does that have to do with the contribution rate? Well, in your retirement plan, you're gonna pay, the contribution is composed of two things. First thing is the $50 that the working people are gonna earn this year, all right? So everybody that works the right number of hours will earn $50 on their benefit this year. So you wanna pay for that. And the cost of that is about $2.10 an hour, okay? The next thing you wanna pay for is if you have any unfunded liabilities from the past, you wanna pay those off over a certain length of time. But you don't have any of those, and you didn't have any last year, so that second part of your contribution has been zero the last couple of years, and, was, and it's still zero because you, you have assets right at your liabilities right now. All right, so you're still, the recommended contribution is basically the cost of the 50 bucks that people are gonna earn this year, all right? And that's pretty close to what you're putting in. Um, nobody asked me, but on the bottom of page Two in the top of page three is a cost increase benefits, and it's about a dollar. It's a little more than a dollar to increase fifty dollars by ten dollars, or in other words, it's right around uh, ten ten cents for every dollar you wanted to raise it. Okay. Now, when I talk about raising that, I'm limiting that only to people that are working right now not people that are gone, not people that are already retired, just you guys and other people that are still working, okay? Um, there is a section here titled Areas of Risk, and you have a bunch of areas of risk in the plan, uh, but the main ones are your investment return and the hours worked. Uh, we're assuming 320,000 hours a year and a 6% return. If you actually had a 0% return next year, I'd estimate the recommended rate would increase by about 35 cents an hour. And if hours fell to about 300,000 a year, I'd estimate that would cost about 15 cents. And if both of those happened, we wouldn't just add those two together, it would kind of be a multiplier effect and that would increase the recommended rate by about 60 cents an hour. Uh, I do want to mention uh, 320,000 hours is a little, is conservative. Uh, since we've stopped contributing on overtime, hours have actually been running around 360,000 a year instead of 320. But you can tell by my white hair, I've been doing this a while. And so I've come to the conclusion and I, develop this mathematically as well, that it's better to be conservative on the hours. And I can give you a kind of rough example why. Suppose you were had a half a million hours a year, all right, and you needed to come up with an extra $100,000, okay? That's 20 cents an hour, all right? Now, suppose you needed to come up with $100,000, but you were only having 200,000 hours a year. Well, that's 50 cents an hour, all right? So I guess what I'm saying is it's a little more painful if hours come out less than what you're expecting than otherwise. So uh, you can show that with what they call utility mathematics, but 
So that's why I'm going to be a little bit conservative on that, unless y'all really throw a fit about it. But uh, so there's where you are on the on the on the retirement. I think you were wise being uh, conservative in the past because uh, you know you had a hit, but you were well funded enough. You were able to absorb that without a lot of pain. Uh, I will tell you there are plans that were marginally funded and they are in awful shape now after last year. So they hope they get this 17 to 19 percent base case return. Well that's just the stocks, but yeah. Yeah. I'd be glad to answer any questions or go through anything else in this report. Thank you, Steve. Any questions from members of the committee? Comments, concerns? Areas to be clarified? Steve, I did send um, your report out as a PDF to members of the committee, and I did the same with the report from Mariner um, as well um, to members of this committee. So just to please pardon me, I'm just high school educated. So a $10 increase would, would require an uh, uh, increase in contribution to about a buck oh six. Yeah. Okay. And that's proportional, in other words, $5 increase is half that amount, $20 increase is twice that amount. Exactly. So, yeah. And that's just for the $10 increase, for a, and for yeah. a 25 to 30 out would require, would require a 16 cents per hour just for the 30 out. Yes. That's a, and that's a current rate, right? Yes, that $50 rate, yeah. Getting clarifications for in case I have questions. Sure. Okay. So to do a ten dollar increase and a thirty an hour would be what? A dollar twenty. An extra dollar twenty an hour. Split between the uh, that would be split between management and uh, the body, correct? That would be an item for negotiation. Again, just need a little clarification here. That's okay. Any other questions? Okay. Thank you for having me. Right. Thank, thanks Thank you to you guys. Um, we will move into old business. Um, one thing I will share with the committee, um, but I guess it's old because I acted upon this. I received a request from a member of the administrative staff. Um, administrative team members do contribute into the pension plan um, who had heard the discussion from the last meeting about the potential increase in contribution rate, um, which as I stated a moment ago, is an item that is bargained amongst the union and Lextran. Um, a member of the administrative team asked me to have Lextrans attorneys, please review the pension plan and provide an analysis on whether or not um, administrative staff members were mandatory participants in the plan. So I um, have asked for that. I have not received any clarification back at this point, um, but the pension plan has existed for a very long time, has had several amendments um, that this group has been a part of over the years, but I did uh, ask for legal review of that, and once I have an answer, we'll make this group aware. That is the only old business that I have, um, and I don't believe I have any new business either. I guess that's sort of old and new for this group. Does anybody else have any business, admin or union? Hearing none, I would make it, uh, ask for a motion for adjournment. So moved. Mr. Paul Schoeninger, a second. second. Todd Birch, thank you very much. Thank, thank you, you, everyone, and I will see you next time.